Trent made the church ready for the Counter-Reformation era. But was the church ready for the birth of modernity? Well, there were some hiccups along the way. Welcome to Sunday School. I'm your instructor, Father Timothy Matkin. I'm glad you joined us for this session on the First Vatican Council. Before we get into our topic, if you would look down below and find and bless that like button. It helps us out greatly. Subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this and share them with those you know on Facebook or Twitter so other people can learn about these topics. Before we begin as well, we want to have a moment of prayer. I invite you to join with me in the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, and the Collect for the Universal Church by Archbishop William Laud. Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And now the Collect for the Universal Church. Let us pray. O gracious Father, we humbly beseech thee for thy holy Catholic Church, that thou wouldst be pleased to fill it with all truth, in all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, establish it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, our study is based on John L. Murray's book, The General Councils of the Church, with additional resources. One of them for this episode is Father Hunnick's delightful blog, Mutual Enrichment at liturgicalnotes.blogspot.com. Now, last week we looked at the Fifth Lateran Council and the Council of Trent, which preceded and followed the Protestant Reformation. And it really illustrates the enormous potential cost of the failure to effect reform in the church when it's needed. Throughout the Middle Ages, growing corruption got some mention in councils, but the follow-through really was lacking. Ultimately, the church did not take the problem seriously enough, and it blew up in their faces with revolt breaking out where reform was needed and lacking. The Council of Trent accomplished the amazing task of having a group of bishops agree to reform themselves. This council sufficed for over 300 years before a new one was needed, but the approach of modernity brought a whole new set of challenges and a new council to face them. In the first half of the 19th century, the foundations upon which the church had rested for centuries seemed to be shaking in the midst, in the eyes of many, Liberalism, in the guise of liberty and equality and fraternity, shook those foundations. Answers were needed. At the First Council of the Vatican in 1869 and 70, the Church took dramatic steps to set things right, culminating in a conciliar definition of papal infallibility. When the Council of Trent had completed its work in 1563, the world was fast becoming a new place in which to live. Within less than 40 years, the new era would clearly overtake the human race. Today we speak of this as the Baroque period, roughly from 1600 to 1750. A new spirit grew out of the Renaissance, a spirit of unrest, of progress, of grandiose ideals. It was the period of Louis XIV, of Newton and Galileo, of Descartes and Spinoza, 
all men who were to leave their mark upon modern civilization, for better or for worse. And as we go through this, there are some names that I will have a little bit of trouble with. In the life of the church, this was a period of great reform, often called the Counter-Reformation, during which men attempted to regain the ground lost by the revolt of Protestant countries. It was the age of Bellarmine and Suarez, of Francis de Sales. It was the time when Milton and Moliere came into prominence, the period of Rembrandt and Rubens, of Monteverde and of Bach. But this was also the age of the religious wars, of Gallicanism, and of widespread colonization. Out of this conflict, however, there arose a second era, which we now refer to as the Classic period, more or less from about 1750 to 1820. And this came more as a reaction to the extremes of the post-Reformation period. This was a time of greater calm, when men turned once again to the ideals of the ancient Greeks, to the objective viewpoint, the emotional restraint, the clarity of form that they felt was expressed there. You notice how, for example, the capital of the United States looks like an ancient Greek civilization. It pulled that inspiration because that was the time period when our country was born. With this, however, there also came a greater emphasis upon man's intellectual strength. And so reason became king. It was the age of reason. Voltaire and Hume and Kant reigned supreme. Mozart and Haydn attempted to express this spirit in music. The national spirit began to rise to prominence, signified, of course, by the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars and the Declaration of Independence and the American Revolution. Even within the church, this spirit of the Enlightenment became quite apparent. Reason tended to be a bit overemphasized and antiquity was idealized far beyond what it really deserved. In 1794, a number of bishops, imbued with this kind of spirit, gathered together at Pistoa in Italy. And this was an illegal gathering. This synod attempted to promulgate decrees that, well, let's just say it failed to give due place to the visible institutional church and which overemphasized the practices of antiquity. And so it was condemned by Pope Pius VI. Finally, in the past century, we can distinguish the spirit of Romanticism from about 1820 to 1900, a further reaction to the cold intellectualism of the classic period. Men discovered once again that man is a living creature with emotions, with a heart, Life became the center of interest, the individual and the nation. The imagination took precedence over the intellect. While Beethoven and Brahms and Wagner, Tchaikovsky and Verdi gave vent to this spirit in music, Dickens and Goethe, Victor Hugo, Longfellow and Poe expressed it in literature. Schopenhauer, Nietzsche and Hegel introduced it to philosophy. This was the Victorian age but it also was destined to be the age of science. Perhaps the most convenient peg for this period is the publication of Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species in 1859. Science had continued its development, and many felt that Darwin was like the prophet of an entirely new era. They weren't exactly wrong. Some felt that this period marked a turning point in history, sort of the end of religion and the reign of science. While nothing so radical actually took place, these advantages, these advances, do exercise a tremendous influence in our present day world. Throughout all these centuries, the church had witnessed no other general council. The decrees of Trent remained the law of the day, completed by the decrees of the Roman pontiffs to implement the council. This last age, however, was to bring forth the 20th General Council as an answer to the extreme rationalism and religious doubt 
that had been developing ever since the revolt, which came to a head in the 19th century. The days of Luther and Calvin, of course, were numbered. Protestantism came rather soon to look upon them as more symbols of a movement than religious teachers in the accepted sense. The first Protestant creeds, such as the Augsburg Confession, became the norm or rule of Protestant teaching, the interpretive lens through which to evaluate the Bible. Sometimes this is referred to as Protestant scholasticism. There was no longer an infallible teaching authority in the visible church, but the Protestant notion of an infallible Bible had also ended up proved wanting. The disagreements among Protestant groups were too apparent to be ignored. Thus, these various creeds and confessions became the norm for interpretation of Scripture. They essentially took the place of the infallible church that they had rejected in the 16th century. There were many revolts against this tendency, resulting in the formation of newer Protestant sects, who chose as their starting point a return to the Bible itself. After Kant and the great emphasis upon reason in the classic period, however, the picture began to change more radically. The Enlightenment had so exalted human reason that it felt able to cast revelation aside. Revealed truths were supposedly truths beyond the grasp of human reason, and this was unacceptable. Kant entered into the dispute in an effort to save faith and revelation, but his defense really sowed the seed of further difficulties. Kant accepted many of the conclusions of the men he opposed. He set out, therefore, to make a fresh start. When he had finished, there was no room in his system for the power of the human mind to know God by reason alone. In place of this, Kant had introduced the notion of an approach to God within man himself. The inner experience of man was really the important element. It only remained for Schleiermacher to adapt this teaching to religion, and this came under the guise of a certain religious feeling or affection. All religion was to be based primarily on some sort of inner awareness of God, and the supernatural. Thus it was no longer the church, nor even the Bible, nor the Protestant creeds and confessions that would determine man's belief, but only his inner experience, man himself. When Schleiermacher died in 1834, the stage was set for the errors of the 19th century, errors that would demand another general council. To this notion of inner experience, outlined by Schleiermacher, there was added a new approach to the Bible, known as biblical criticism. The Bible, no less than the teaching of the church, was now to appear as an expression of the inner feeling of the Christian community. Thus, the Bible had a gradual history, and upon occasion even contradicted itself, depending upon the different experiences of various communities. When this was combined with the main thought of the 19th century, that of evolution and Darwin, Protestantism was faced with a full theory of the evolution of doctrine as a purely natural process. Christian faith was, in other words, nothing more than the end product of this experience of the community. And so it was an evolving one, a changing thing. And when creeds no longer expressed properly the present-day experience, well, the creeds had to be changed or reinterpreted. It is this line of thought that leads modern Protestantism to deny such basic truths as the virgin birth or the divinity of Christ or even the existence of God. Ultimately, this movement was to result in the 19th century liberalism of Harnack, for example, and in present-day modernism which is named after the era in which it rose to prominence, the modern era, which was about a century ago. It is difficult to distinguish between these two, really. If we can at all, we might say that liberalism began with the Christian tradition 
and made an attempt to adjust it to the new and changing world. Modernism, however, starts with the scientific method and investigates faith on that basis, more or less permitting traditional beliefs to take care of themselves as best they can. In neither instance, however, do we still retain a true Christian faith, a supernatural revelation of divine truths. The Vatican Council, the first one, stands out as the Church's greatest answer to this beginning of the liberal movement. About 1864, Pope Pius IX indicated his intention of summoning a general council, the first in 300 years. Shortly after that, he issued an encyclical, Quanta Cura, and a syllabus of errors, a, a list of problems and bad ideas, both condemning the teachings of the modern rationalists and socialists. These, in turn, reflected earlier condemnations of the teachings of individual men who taught specific errors. Gregory the uh, 16th, for example, had condemned Hermes in 1835 for his unwarranted exaltation of human reason, and Bautain later on for teaching that human reason could know God only after revelation and faith. In 1857, Pius IX, or Pio Nono as he was lovingly called, he himself had condemned the false rationalism of Gunther and the errors that resulted from it, and in 1862 he had condemned Froschammer for similar teachings. These were all signs of an unhealthy acceptance within the Church of the errors developing in the Protestant thought of the day and in the secular world. That had to be stopped. And who was it who had the job to put his foot down? Well, it was the Pope. And the Pope's desire was that a forthcoming council would complete this task. More time was needed to prepare the council, however. In 1865, the Pope sought the views of a number of bishops concerning the advisability of having a council. And the matter was, at that time, kept secret. In 1867, however, Pius IX announced his intentions publicly, and a congregation of cardinals began the work of preparing the decrees to be submitted to the judgment and deliberation of the council. To assist in this work, about a hundred theologians from Rome and elsewhere in the world were associated with the cardinals. Some subcommittees were formed to discuss particular questions, doctrine, ecclesiastical and political matters, the missions and church reunion, church discipline, ceremonial and religious orders. In this, the Vatican Council differed somewhat from Trent, which preceded it. At Trent, the so-called minor theologians worked at the same time that the bishops held their discussions. It was hoped that the work of the theologians would be finished, as far as possible, before the council itself began its deliberations. In June of 1868, the Pope issued a solemn decree convoking the council and declaring that it should open on December 8, 1869. At this point, there was no special mention of the definition of papal infallibility. Nevertheless, the question was being debated at that time, and long before the council officially opened, the periodicals of the world were alive with this discussion. The central question whether such a definition would make the position of the church more secure in the modern world, or, on the other hand, would prove a threat to its security in the modern world. Those who favored the definition were much concerned with the rise of nationalism in those days and those ever reoccurring wars that they led to. There was a possibility that the Pope might be taken captive and exiled. They felt, therefore, that this definition would spell out more clearly the full authority the Pope would possess regardless. Others, however, had fears that this was not the expedient thing to do. 
The world was so upset that this seemed to be an unwise move, inviting further disputes with the rationalists of the age. There were also some who apparently did not believe in papal infallibility, those who later left the Catholic Church when the doctrine was defined by the Council. They became the old Catholics. The entire world, however, had witnessed the exercise of this papal infallibility in 1854, when Pius IX had solemnly defined the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. And of course, this was the feast day that he decided would be the opening of the council. Some 576 bishops had responded to the inquiry of the Pope before he took this step to define the doctrine. What was being debated now at the council was mostly a question of the expediency of the solemn definition of this papal infallibility. The preconciliar discussion resulted from the speculation of the various newspapers concerning what would be treated at the council. The result was a heated debate on the matter of defining this dogma. The foremost leader of those who considered the definition as not expedient that, at that time was Bishop dupont loup of Orléans in France. Archbishop de Champ and Cardinal Manning were strong supporters of the definition of papal infallibility. In Germany, however, a professor of history at the University of Munich, Ignaz Dollinger was strongly opposed to the definition. He based his position on reason and history, and in doing so he lost sight of the infallible teaching authority of the Church. When the dogma was finally defined, Dollinger refused to accept the doctrine and was eventually excommunicated. In 1871, he gathered about him a number of similar-minded men who spoke out against the impudence and ignorance of Rome. Some of them set about forming a religious group of their own. This again is what we call the Old Catholics. Actually, there were Old Catholics before this, going back to a schism in the Netherlands, in Utrecht. And so these new Old Catholics joined the previous Old Catholics because by this time they had harmonized many of their positions. They proposed to follow nothing but scripture and tradition, and for them tradition meant history, and there was no place for the infallible teaching authority of the church in the present day. While these disputes continued, the work of the commissions went on at Rome. The council opened as planned on December 8, 1869. More than 700 bishops in all attended. They came from literally all over the world. Talk about ecumenical. So that considering the large number and the area the bishops represented, the Vatican Council was surely the most outwardly general council ever held up to that time. The meetings took place in the right transept of St. Peter's Basilica. The sequel, Vatican II, would occupy much more of the building. Pius IX had established the procedure to be followed. The preparatory commissions were to issue the result of their labor, a so-called schema, which amounted to a suggested form for the definitions of the council. These were printed and distributed to all the bishops to have something to look at to start with. They had from eight to ten days to make in writing any observations they desired. These were turned into what were known as the deputations. There were five of these, one which dealt with the new topics to be suggested, and four others concerned with questions of faith, of discipline, of religious orders, and of the missions and oriental rites. Actually, only the deputation of faith came into real prominence in the sessions. The council had to be terminated before other projects could be discussed. The preparatory work proved valuable, however, in later works of the church, especially in the codification of canon law, which took place in 1918, the first real systematic codification of canon law in the West. 
The deputation would decide if a particular suggestion were necessary or pertinent. The final decisions of the deputation were ratified by the General Assembly. It was in the so-called general congregations, the ordinary meetings of the bishops, that the bishops discussed all the matters. Every bishop was free to express his view. He had only to ask for time when he might talk. As a result, over 420 speeches were given. About one-fourth of them concerned this issue of papal infallibility. These discussions labored under two handicaps. For one, the acoustics of St. Peter's left much to be desired. The problem was solved somewhat by the printing of the schemas and the suggested changes, but it was difficult at times to hear the speaker. In addition, Latin was the language spoken, that makes sense for an international gathering, in the Latin church. And it was soon realized that the Latin pronunciation of the various nationalities was so varied that many could not quite understand other bishops who were making speeches. What was said at these general congregations, and there were about 89 in all, resulted in further changes in the decree being discussed, amendments. The suggested changes were distributed to all, and then one of the members of the particular deputation concerned would explain the reasons why the deputation either chose to accept or reject that particular suggestion. After this, a vote of the entire assembly would be taken on their decisions. It was in this regard that Archbishop Gasser became a prominent figure in the council, since he spoke most often for the deputation of faith. When all had agreed on the final form, a public session was held. All the faithful were admitted to St. Peter's for these four public sessions the opening session, and one for a profession of faith, and two at which the two decrees of the council were formally promulgated, one in April and one in July of 1870. Soon after the council opened, the first draft of the decree on faith was distributed to the bishops. It was a long document, very complicated in nature, and it evoked a great deal of discussion, lasting until January 10th. It was then handed over once again to the Deputation of Faith to be revised and amended. Toward the end of February, a greatly shortened version was ready. It included only the first part of the original version, which was four chapters in all. These touched on God the Creator, on Revelation, on Faith, and on the relationship between Faith and Reason. The discussion on this new version began on March 14, 1870, and lasted until April 12th. For the most part, it was a rather calm and systematic discussion. The final vote was taken on April 12th, and on the 24th of that month, the dogmatic constitution De Filius was solemnly promulgated in the third public session of the Council. The attention then turned officially to the question of papal infallibility. Unofficially, it had already become the dominant theme of the Council. During the very first months of the Council, suggestions had been sent to the deputations asking that the matter of papal infallibility be treated at the Council. The discussions of the previous years indicated the need for this. Public discussion at the Council, however, was sidetracked until the decree on faith had been first settled. Nevertheless, in January of 1870, the bishops had been presented with a schema on the church. This was also a very lengthy document, treating of the nature of the church, of the pope, and of church-state relations. This schema was indiscreetly passed on to certain periodicals, and this further complicated the matter. Even the civil governments, who had not taken part in the council at all, now became somewhat concerned over this proposed decree. In the original schema, there was no mention of a definition of papal infallibility. Because of the desires of many bishops within the council, however, a new section dealing with this question was added to the suggested schema. When the schema reached the open discussion stage, 
only one section was actually proposed, that on the Pope. The Council had broken up before the remainder of the decree on the nature of the Church could be treated. Within the Council, the same divisions appeared that had been apparent in the periodicals. There were those bishops who thought the papal infallibility should be defined, and those who thought it was inopportune. It's important to remember that at this time, papal infallibility was basically accepted throughout the Church. The heretical teachings of Constance and Basil were now completely ignored. The French clergy had issued a declaration in 1682 called the Gallican Decree, which had failed to give due place to the position of the Roman pontiff in the church. But by this time the decree had been set aside, even in France itself. The opposition was based for the most part on the spirit of the times, claiming that this made the definition ill-advised at this particular moment, that it would only invite further troubles and complicate matters. Best to let it be for the time. Actually, when the definition was issued, these effects, which had been so feared, failed to materialize generally. It was mostly an error in judgment in this regard, predicting what would happen when the decision was made. The disputes continued within the Council, both in public and in private. It was often a heated debate, and eventually, as you can imagine, quite a tiresome one. In January of 1870, some 135 bishops indicated that they were opposed to placing the question of infallibility in the schema at that time. 27 of the 40 Americans were included in this group. The majority ruled, however. The discussions continued from January to April in private, and in the general sessions from April until July. Some attempts had been made to have the issue set aside while the Council was still debating the decree on faith. But Pope Pius IX was insistent by now that the matter should be treated. The reaction of some outspoken individuals outside the Council only confirmed the opinion of most of the bishops that the question at this point really had to be settled. By March of 1870, it was decided, with the approval of the Pope, that the question be raised officially. On March 6, the bishops received an addition to the schema on the Church, which proposed the dogma of papal infallibility. On May 9, the final constitution to be discussed was distributed to the bishops, and the debate began in the formal sessions. The new version, vastly different from the very first draft, contained only the section on the Roman pontiff. It consisted of a preamble and four chapters and included a solemn definition of papal infallibility. It had been reworked by the deputation of faith and the theologians who were serving as consultants. By June 3rd, enough bishops wanted to close the debate to bring this about. The other sections of the decree were then discussed and the final decree fashioned. By July 13th, a final vote on the matter could be taken. This was the 85th session of the Council. 601 bishops were present. 451 voted in favor of the decree. 88 voted against it. And 62 voted in favor, provided that suggested corrections were made. The fact that one-fourth of the bishops had voted against the decree, or had at least limited their approval, caused considerable disturbance. Among this one-fourth were some very big names. It was clear, however, that the matter would be defined, and those who thought it inopportune chose the plan of quietly leaving Rome. In In this way, they would not have to vote publicly against the decree. When the final vote was taken on July 18th, there were 535 bishops who voted in favor of the decree. Two voted against it. Bishop Riccio of Sicily, and Bishop Fitzgerald of Little Rock, Arkansas. These two immediately submitted to the new definition of the Church once it had been approved, and the other bishops who had left Rome 
did so in the months that followed. In this way, the Council answered the rationalists of the 19th century. These liberals had denied faith and stability in belief. The Church defined its precise notion of faith and added to that its position on the doctrinal stability associated with the Roman pontiff, who as the successor of Peter has the duty and obligation to teach the faith, and in this definition did so with a special charism of infallibility. The next day, July 19th, the imperial government in France, in Paris, declared war on Prussia, and for all practical purposes, this marked the end of the First Vatican Council. The bishops had to leave. Only those from distant seas remained, in addition to the Italians. The number of the sessions went down from 136 to 127 to 104. On September 20th, the city of Rome had been invaded, and on October 9th, the city had voted to join the Kingdom of Italy. Under these conditions, the council could not continue, and any suggestions to move it to another city were simply set aside. And so finally, on October 20th, 1870, the council was temporarily suspended without being dissolved until a later but unspecified date. And of course, it was never reconvened. And Pius IX died in 1878. The Vatican Council, the first one, had nevertheless achieved its primary goal and strengthened the Church by establishing a secure line of action for even more difficult times that lay ahead. The idea of papal infallibility, that the Pope can teach and have a charism of infallibility when he speaks with the consensus of the Church on only matters of faith and morals. This idea springs out of the doctrine of the indefectibility of the Church. Remember, Jesus had said that the gates of Hades, or of death, would never prevail against the Church. That means it would never die out, nor go so fundamentally astray that it would no longer be the Church, and hence the Church would die. It would make sense, then, that whomever is in the position to have the final word in the Church on some fundamental matter of faith would thereby have a special grace of protection to speak the truth in that moment and avoid leading the Church off the rails. This is the value of papal infallibility in the modern era, especially now when the world grows smaller and people look more and more to one man for answers about what Christians believe. The definition of the Council is as follows in Pastor Eternus, section 9, quote, We teach and define as a divinely revealed dogma that when the Roman pontiff speaks ex cathedra, cathedra is his throne, the symbol of his office, that is, when in exercise of his office as shepherd and teacher of all Christians, in virtue of his supreme apostolic authority, he defines a doctrine concerning faith or morals to be held by the whole Church. He possesses, by the divine assistance promised to him in Blessed Peter, that infallibility which the divine Redeemer willed his Church to enjoy in defining doctrine concerning faith or morals. Well, of course, as we mentioned, this council was cut short. At the council which followed, the idea of authority and infallibility was expanded and elaborated upon in returning to address the issues of ecclesiology about the Church, pointing also to a locus of infallibility in the College of Bishops, speaking together, such as in an ecumenical council, and also to the census fidelium, the consensus of the faithful in belief. Others have recognized the value of such a ministry vested in a universal primate, whom all parties agree would be the Roman see, the Pope, in any possible future reunion of churches. 
and openness to the idea of a special charism has been a part of that discussion. The Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission, or ARCIC, addressed these issues in the agreed statements on the gift of authority in the Church. In section 28 of Authority in the Church, part 2, we read, Although responsibility for preserving the Church from fundamental error belongs to the whole Church, it may be exercised on its behalf by a universal primate. That, of course, is, would be a reference to the Pope. And in section 33, quote, If any Petrine function and office are exercised in the living Church of which a universal primate is called to serve as a visible focus, then it inheres in his office that he should have both a defined teaching responsibility and appropriate gifts of the Spirit to enable him to discharge it. So, this is a positive thing. And also, this is what we might say the positive side, which vests authority in the papacy to define doctrine in Peter's responsibility to teach the truth and to strengthen the brethren. But in hindsight, there's also another side to papal infallibility as defined by Vatican I. The effect, perhaps unintended consequence of the definition, is that it places constitutional limits on the exercise of that ministry for the first time. Rather than create that authority in the church, it takes it and restricts it. Consider the observations of Father John Hunnick from England in his entry, blog entry, Dusting Down the Archives, What the Pope is For. He writes, After that admirable council, Vatican I, which so happily defined, or set the limits of, the infallible teaching authority of the Bishop of Rome, the German Episcopate replied to Bismarck's attack on the Council thus, The Pope cannot be called an absolute monarch, since he is subject to divine law, and is bound to those things which Christ set in order for his Church. He cannot change the constitution of the Church, which was given to it by its divine founder. The constitution of the Church, in all essential matters, is founded in the divine arrangement and is therefore immune from every arbitrary human disposition. Hunnick says, I wrote this on September 3, 2010, when we were still in the Church of England. He has since converted to Rome. Although I say so myself, it seems to me eerily prescient of what needs to be said now, in a time when, once again, the old and evil maximalizing notion of the papacy you know, the idea the Pope can do anything, has raised its exceedingly ugly head, a time when many good people are very fearful, however wrongly, that a Pope might act on the ultra vires assumption that he has competence to override the tradition, to shove the very words of Christ himself into the fridge. I have preserved an interesting comment from the old thread. It goes like this. The language of the Vatican I decrees on the Roman pontiff is admittedly formidable at first reading. So wrote Dom Gregory Dix, and he proceeded in a brilliant and witty tour de force to demonstrate their congruity, not only with the second century, but also with the New Testament. Hunnick writes, I think it was right. The language of those decrees does rather give the impression of having been written with a deliberate intention of upsetting the horses. Yet John Henry Newman, despite his earlier apprehensions about what the ultramontanes, those who looked beyond the mountains to the Pope for the answer about everything, that's what ultramontanism is all about, kind of extreme papalists, uh, particularly England's own dangerously ultramontane Cardinal Manning. Um, Despite his earlier, Newman's earlier apprehensions about what the Ultramontanes were getting up to in Rome, sighed with relief when he saw this wording and memorably commented, quote, Nothing has been passed of consequence. What can look so intimidating, if you lack a certain sort of background, can seem 
matter of course, or even inconsequential, when one does have a sense of the context. What one might call the body language of the Vatican I decrees can seem frightening. They can appear to suggest that the Pope can at will impose new dogmas and directly manipulate the life of any individual Catholic. Those who see them in this way have some excuses for their anxieties. Wilfred Ward was but one of the ultra-montanes who did believe something frighteningly like that. But Ward's dotty excesses were not what the decrees may mean, or indeed even come anywhere near to saying. Newman and Ratzinger, Ratzinger of course became Pope Benedict XVI, they are strikingly similar in their approach to what the papacy intrinsically is. Newman, from his old, patris old Anglican patristic literary background, found himself writing, quote, it is one of the reproaches urged against the Church of Rome, that it has originated nothing and has only served as a sort of remora or break in the development of dogma. And he goes on, quote, and it is an objection which I embrace as a truth, for such I conceive to be the main purpose of its extraordinary gift. And it continues, the heart of the role which the Roman Church plays within the universal church is, in other words, negative, to be a barrier against the encroachment of novelties. It is important to grasp this because the two high-profile actions of Roman pontiffs, which in most minds have been associated with this idea of papal infallibility in action, are the two Marian dogmas defined. Non-Catholics, therefore, tend to judge the purpose of the Roman magisterium in the light of these two manifestations of it. And this is unfortunate. Those two definitions are really side issues, not typical of what Rome has meant through two millennia. What is typical, as Newman says, is a caution, a conservatism, a sense of the dangers of being daring and clever. The need to be creative is not often found in the writings of St. Leo the Great and so on. A patristic scholar, less remembered nowadays than he deserves, my Hunnock's distinguished professor at the Church of St. Thomas the Martyr in Oxford, Dr. Jalland, wrote of Rome's, quote, strange, almost mystical faithfulness to type, its marked degree of changelessness, its steadfast clinging to tradition and precedent. Papa Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, comes at the question in exactly the same way as Newman and Jalland. This cautious sense of his essentially negative role is at the heart of his wise discharge of his pontificate, and nobody should have been surprised at this who had read his words. Ratzinger saying, quote, the First Vatican Council had in no way defined the Pope as an absolute monarch. On the contrary, it presented him as the guarantor of obedience to the revealed word. The Pope's authority is bound to the tradition of faith. The authority of the Pope is not unlimited it is at the service of sacred tradition. And it concludes, I think this is finally put, revealed word, the sacred tradition. Well, thank you for joining us for this study. Next week, we conclude by leaving behind John L. Murphy's book on the General Councils and venture into the sequel to the First Vatican Council. And he wrote this history of the councils in anticipation of that one. We'll see if we can live up to his ability to tell the tale of the general councils of the church. If you're in Dallas, I invite you to come by and join us for worship. You can look us up online and learn all about us at stfrancisdallas.org. Please like and share, and we will see you there. God bless. Holy, holy